In July 1926, the Schlage Lock Company was months from bankruptcy. Customer demand was not the problem. Keeping up with it was. In the first year, factory output grew from 400 locks a month to 20,000. That sounds phenomenal, but few companies have a plan for handling that kind of growth. Schlage was overextended, and everyone could see it wasn't working. Walter Schlage was running out of chances, and his beloved company was one wrong decision away from becoming a cautionary tale of how a company can still fail despite having a perfect idea at the perfect time with the power to change an industry for generations to come. Growing up in Roda, Germany, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, Walter Schlage and his father often went on trips to the nearby Carl Zeiss Optical Works Factory. There they witnessed the creation of machinery with unprecedented precision, meticulous detail, and technical wizardry. Walter joined the Zeiss Company as an apprentice at age 14 and graduated with academic recognition in the factory's engineering department. Despite his success, his childhood dream of travel beckoned, so he left Germany at age 18. Over the next five years, Walter traveled 23,000 miles and held at least five different jobs. In 1906, Walter was 23 years old and had settled himself in San Francisco. He found a job in the telephone repair department of the Western Electric Company. Four months later, a catastrophic earthquake struck the city. More than 3,000 people were killed. 28,000 buildings were destroyed. And 225,000 people were left homeless. Walter survived, as did the California Electrical Works building in which he worked but his home did not. He was forced to piece together a shelter from iron scraps and wood, measuring a modest six feet by eight feet. It had no windows, no floor, and just one door. He would live in that shanty for a year. As time went on and the city recovered, Walter put down roots. He started a family, took night classes in electrical engineering, and rented a small workshop for his experiments. He had a talent for noticing problems hidden in plain sight. For example, when entering a darkened room, you would have to find the switch in the dark to turn on the lights. Walter reasoned that if you turn a knob to open the door, then that knob should automatically turn on the lights too. So he bought a lock, wired it to a switch, and patented his first invention. Despite its creativity, the light switch lock had one downfall. It had a tendency to shock people. Walter himself would receive many jolts before ultimately scrapping the idea. But he had taken a pivotal step in his journey. He had purchased a lock. Walter now turned his attention in a new direction. I was keenly interested in the development of patentable devices which could be commercially produced, utilizing mass production principles. Practically all of my spare time was directed towards such problems. At that time in the early 1900s, mass production was not common in factories. But Walter realized that how you build is just as important as what you build. While in his workshop, he spotted another problem hidden in plain sight. Doorknobs inside rooms still needed the key to unlock them. If you misplaced the key, you would be locked in. Walter reasoned that since the doorknob opens the door, perhaps the knob should also unlock it. In 1917, he patented a lock that worked by actually tilting the knob, tilt up to lock the door, and back down to unlock it. Walter had created a lock that not only worked, but improved on the previous design. And this time, he would not abandon his invention. In 1918, he left Western Electric to turn his experiments into his livelihood, introducing his tilting knob lock to the world. However, without a steady income, the clock was ticking. Walter had his invention and his patent, but if he wanted to manufacture it, he needed money. 
Joseph Roig was a speculative builder doing well in the post-World War I construction boom. After an invitation to meet Walter and visit his shop, Joseph saw the potential in building houses that featured this new and innovative lock, and their business partnership began. Joseph started raising capital and organizing the business, while Walter developed the manufacturing equipment. On August 23, 1920, the Schlage Manufacturing Company was officially created. It was Joseph's idea to name the company after Walter, a fitting tribute to a revolutionary inventor. While preparing the tilting knob lock for mass production, Walter began to look for other ways to improve on the mortise lock. Common mortise locks had many parts and took significant labor to install. Walter imagined a lock that required less door preparation and installed quickly, with parts that fit together precisely. His solution was filed in a patent application on April 12, 1920, and would change the industry forever. Compared to the average mortise lock, Walter's lock installed with a quarter of the parts and just two small holes, no complicated chiseling. And the entire lock structure was mass producible, making it faster to manufacture and more consistent in shape and size. Parts would not require hand fitting or filing. And with the creative application of one of his earlier inventions, Walter realized his new lock could replace the tilting knob lock entirely. He had previously patented an indicating push-button device, now known as a push-in, push-out switch. It can still be seen today in retractable pens. Applying that concept to his lock, Walter developed a simple, effective doorknob that locked with a push of a button. And with just a turn of the knob, it unlocked automatically. Almost immediately, Joseph and the board of directors canceled the tilting knob design and approved a plan to produce the button lock. The next challenge was creating mass production equipment, which would take Walter two painstaking years. The company finally began sales in January 1924, producing 391 locks that month. Within a year, they'd grown to 100 employees strong, producing 20,000 locks a month. In 1925, the company reorganized adopting the name that would become their identity, the Schlage Lock Company. To accommodate the growing demand, Schlage took its biggest risk yet. Their original factory space had reached its limit, so they purchased land in San Francisco's Visitation Valley to build a new factory. Specially designed, the plant had a sawtooth roof to provide better lighting and ventilation for employees and the Southern Pacific Railroad even built a special track extension directly to the factory to help speed up shipments. The new plant was dedicated in 1926 in a grand ceremony that included the mayor of San Francisco. Even though business was booming, this growing success could be the company's downfall. Between their land purchase, the new factory, and the increasing number of employees, all their investments added up to a considerable deficit, a debt that would equal more than $1 million today. They were more successful than they could afford to be. And at the current pace, the company would be bankrupt by the end of the year. Reorganizing the company was not an option. The bank was not going to extend another loan. To avoid collapse, the Schlage Lock Company needed a new leader someone with experience in growing small businesses, someone with the right balance of bold risk-taking and sound financial acumen, someone by the name of Charles Kendrick. A San Francisco native, Charles Kendrick was an influential businessman and civic leader, determined to see his hometown prosper. He graduated from law school, but San Francisco's rapid growth drew him to real estate. He was 30 years old when the earthquake struck, I was caught in the very vortex of it, and it seemed that I was witnessing the death throes of a great city, the city of my birth. And the farther I walked, the more I felt that the fallen city could never rise again, a great city vanishing in flame. Little wonder that many of those beset by ruin could see no hope, believing that San Francisco would never be again. After the earthquake, many residents left San Francisco, vowing never to return. But not Charles Kendrick. He was among the first to resume business, 
opening a real estate office downtown to aid the city's recovery. 20 years later in 1926, Charles was one of San Francisco's premier business and civic leaders. He transformed a steel wool sponge company from a startup to a household name, built a factory in the city, and served his country in World War I, earning a Purple Heart and Silver Star. His leadership expertise and sterling reputation made him the perfect candidate to save the Schlage Lock Company. When approached by the company's board of directors, Charles agreed to take on management temporarily just to resolve the crisis. He knew that for his city to grow, San Francisco needed dependable, long-term industry, and Schlage offered both progressive manufacturing and futuristic innovation. Quickly taking charge, he instituted numerous economies and sound business practices, selling surplus equipment, canceling orders for new machinery, and insisting on prompt payments. Within six months, the business was back on track, and he was elected president of the company. With Charles and Walter working together, the Schlage Lock Company grew into an increasingly dangerous threat to their competitors. The other major door hardware companies paid little attention to Schlage, figuring it was too small to make a difference. But consumers loved the push-button feature and the smooth, reliable operation. Soon, Schlage locks began appearing on dealer shelves around the country. And when advertisements started listing the upstart company above century-old lock brands, competitors could not ignore Schlage any longer. The first thing that confronted our growth was an effort by the Big Four to close the market to Schlage locks. The Big Four were Yale, Corbin, Ruswin, and Sargent. They ran the builder's hardware business and fought like tigers among themselves, but quickly closed ranks whenever a company threatened their control of the industry. One of them wanted to buy Schlage to get rid of it, having too much invested in mortise locks to let our locks become a competitor. The Schlage lock had a level of quality that competitors couldn't comprehend. Incredibly thin metal, precisely shaped, lightweight construction, yet strong. Hollow spindles, allowing room for the mechanisms to support a variety of functions. Walter's innovations were seemingly endless, and other companies had little hope of competing, not with the lock's comprehensive patent protection. In the 1920s, a typical invention was granted an average of 15 claims on a patent. Walter's lock was awarded 45 ensuring Schlage locks would be unrivaled for years to come. The Big Four threatened to take their entire lines away from their dealers if they promoted the sales of the newfangled Schlage locks. We combated this opposition by selling jobs direct. The salesman sought out some small dealer and gave him orders to fill. Thus, the company rapidly made small dealers into important ones. When the large dealers saw small dealers become competitors through orders for our locks, they decided to sell Schlage products also. By the fall of 1929, the company's finances had been stable for years. 70% of new homes in San Francisco included Schlage locks, and sales around the country were increasing. And then, the stock market crashed. The ensuing Great Depression threatened the financial stability of the entire nation, including the Schlage Lock Company. The company overextended its bank credit by about $250,000, a large amount for a small company at this time. To liquidate the frozen credit, the bank urged us to sell out to a large hardware company and went so far as to arrange a meeting. I returned and informed the bank of the ridiculous price the company had offered, and that its president had stated that if he bought Schlage, he would close the plant. Despite this, the bank still urged me to accept. I countered, stating that, if further pressed, I would advise the Chamber of Commerce that a young San Francisco company with valuable patents and fine potential was being forced to sell out to one of its competitors who would close the plant. This persuaded the bank to take a more reasonable attitude. Meanwhile, it had become evident that if we were to survive, we would need additional working capital. To save the Schlage Lock Company, Charles Kendrick put his professional and civic reputation on the line. He worked without compensation and paid the company's bills with his own money. His risk and sacrifice led to success for both him and the business. They had weathered the Great Depression, and that was the last of Schlage's great growing pains. 
Walter and Charles deeply valued each other's talents and remained an ideal team for the next 20 years, building a full product line, the standard A-lock, the B deadbolt, the C and D heavy duty locks, and the E entrance trim lock sets. Charles expanded the business internationally, and by 1940, 20% of total sales came from outside the United States. The company's advanced manufacturing capability was called upon by the military in World War II, and Schlage received rare recognition for excellence in wartime production. In the 1950s, the company built a reputation for beautiful custom hardware offering decorative escutcheons that were both mass-produced and highly customizable. Walter's vision was to continue making innovative devices he could patent and mass-produce. At the time of his unexpected death at the age of 64, over three million of his locks were installed on doors throughout the world. He had more door lock patents than any other person, more than 200 globally, a record that would last for decades. In a tribute speech, Charles Kendrick commemorated his dear partner and teammate. In the passing of Walter Schlage, the West loses a great mechanical genius. He completely revolutionized the whole art of lockmaking. A simple, honest man, he gave no thought to personal praise or profit. In his every waking hour, he was interested solely in his inventions and their perfection. He had a remarkable creative mind which had the faculty of finding a simple solution for any mechanical problem presented to him. His fellow workers will always remember him as a man who understood and sympathized with their problems. His friends knew him as a lovable character whose innate modesty left him entirely unaware of his marvelous genius. Walter's son Ernest, a Stanford and MIT graduate, assumed engineering leadership at Schlage after his father's death in 1946. He continued inventing new ways to improve lock designs and eventually established the Research Engineering Division with an entire team of inventors who, like Walter, were dedicated to finding simple solutions to problems hidden in plain sight. In 1953, company leadership also transitioned from father to son. Marin Kendrick began in the machine shop, rising through the ranks to become president when his father advanced to chairman of the board. Throughout his tenure, Marin was praised for balancing his disciplined leadership with a sense of family among all employees. Charles passed away in 1970 at the age of 93. He is best remembered in this introduction to his memoirs. In all his business endeavors, he had to begin at the bottom and build from there. From age 12, when he quit school to make his own way in the world, all that he did had to be done the hard way. Perhaps it was because of this that he rose from obscurity to fame, built enduring civic monuments which perpetuate his memory, amassed the wealth he so generously and widely shared, contributed immensely to the upbuilding of his native city and state. Charles Kendrick takes on the stature of one of San Francisco's most distinguished sons, a man in whom was exemplified the greatness of real goodness and the goodness of real greatness. It was so easy to work for them. And everybody was congenial, you know what I mean? Which, again, I think that's what makes one Schlage so unique and why these people, after all these years, are still bound together as a family. Schlage Lock Company was the best job I ever had. Locks are my life. And I went to work every day and I made locks. And it was a family environment. It was, you know, it was, we made the place run.